All right, hello and welcome everyone to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. Um, my name is Alex Caberly. I'm a CCAST research specialist with the University of Arizona, and I'm a co-host for this CCAST webinar series. So you can find more information on CCAST um, at the link in the chat box that Matt is gonna provide. And I'd also like to note, this is the second in a series of webinars on non-native aquatic species. And um, this webinar series is in support of an emerging non-native aquatic species community of practice. So today, Heidi Blasius with the Bureau of Land Management will be presenting a webinar on green sunfish control efforts for native fish conservation in Arivaipa and Bonita Creeks. Heidi is a fisheries biologist with the Bureau of Land Management uh, based out of the Safford field office and her efforts for over a decade in both Arivaipa and Bonita Creeks have led to some really impressive sunfish eradica eradication results, which we will hear about more today. Um, so if you have any questions for Heidi, please enter them in the chat box on the bottom right corner of your screen. And Matt and I will moderate these questions after Heidi's presentation, so we'll have some time for uh, Heidi to take your questions. So with that, I'd now like to turn it over to Heidi for her presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Alex. Welcome everyone. I'm very excited to have this opportunity today to share with you details on the mechanical removal of green sunfish, Lapoma cyanellus, from both Bonita and Aravaipa Creeks, which are two totally different systems, as these projects have been part of my life for over 10 years, as Alex mentioned. Um, before I begin, So it doesn't appear like I can switch screens, Alex. Okay. Okay, I, I have it figured out. Apologize, everybody. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Jeff Kahn. Jeff used to work for the Bureau of Land Management out of the Safford office, but in 2017, he took a position with the National Park Service in Tucson, Arizona. Jeff was integral in both projects as he secured additional funding that was critical for project success. He helped outline removal methods and timeline, and most importantly, he helped remove a lot of green sunfish. So thank you very much, Jeff. Today I'll be presenting on two case studies that look at the efficacy of mechanical removal of green sunfish at Bonita Creek and Horse Camp Canyon, which is a tributary to Aravaipa Creek. The star right here denotes Aravaipa, and this one right here denotes Bonita Creek. Both Bonita and Aravaipa Creeks are located within southeastern Arizona and are unique in that they still support intact or relatively intact native fish assemblages, and they are closed systems as the Bureau of Reclamation has constructed fish barriers across both of them through their Gila River Basin Native Fish Conservation Program to prevent non-natives from moving um, upstream into habitats that are occupied by native fish, which some are federally listed as endangered or threatened. Um, both systems also are threatened by the presence of non-native predatory and competitive fish species, particularly the highly piscivorous green sunfish. So green sunfish are native to the Mississippi River basins, and they have been introduced either intentionally or accidentally throughout the majority of the United States. And as you can see here in Arizona, they're pretty much found throughout the entire state. Green sunfish are extremely piscivorous, and this picture right here shows um, a large female with um, a helitopminal, which is a federally endangered fish species in its mouth. So we do have evidence that these fish prey upon um, a lot of our native fish species. Green sunfish, the females are also highly fecund, and one female is capable of producing anywhere between 10,000 to 50,000 eggs and multiple spawns over a season. And what's really important is that they have, um, during their spawning season, it might last up to four months. So um, that's gonna be largely dependent on their geographic range and temperature, 
but you can see with that level of fecundity, what impacts that they can have on some of these systems that we have here in the Southwest. So to improve conditions for native fish, we initiated mechanical removal of non-native fish in Lower Bonita Creek in 2009 and in Horse Camp Canyon in 2010. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the Bonita Creek case study first. So this is a picture of Bonita Creek. Bonita Creek is unique in that it is dominated by beaver dam pools like this one. And this one is like over 100, me 100 meters long and anywhere from 30 to 40 meters wide. Um, and these pool type habitats provide really ideal habitat for green sunfish. The shorelines, as you can see, are also vegetated with both emergent and submerged vegetation. And there's a lot of large woody debris left over from the beavers. So again, it provides really great habitat for green sunfish. So Bonita Creek is located approximately 12 miles northeast of Safford, Arizona. It originates on the San Carlos Apache um, Indian Reservation where the flow is mostly intermittent. It flows south down into the Gila Box Riparian National Conservation Area, which is designated here with the blue outline. Um, when it enters the Gila Box, the flow is mainly perennial. The creek is effectively divided into a lower, I'm sorry, a lower and upper section based on the city of Stafford's infiltration gallery. The city extracts water at this site for municipal purposes for residents of the Gila Valley. The lower section of Bonita Creek is also bisected um, by low water road crossings, which are designated with these little green dots. The low water road crossings provide both administrative and recreational access throughout the lower section of Bonita Creek for both the city of Stafford and also just recreators. And the triangle right here represents the Bonita Creek fish barrier, which is located approximately one and a half miles upstream of its confluence with the Gila River. In 2008, the lower portion of Bonita Creek was site of a multi-agency native fish restoration project um, that included construction of a fish barrier that you see right here, native fish and snore mud turtle salvage, and also aquatic invertebrates, and a chemical treatment using the piscicide rotenone. So I just wanted to point out, um, this is Chuck Neakley. He was part of the, the project and he's holding a snore, um, snore chub. This is another picture of a snore chub that was salvaged. This is a picture of a snore mud turtle that was salvaged. And all the fish species that were salvaged, they were held on site in these 500 gallon collapsible circular tanks. And the mud turtles that were salvaged were held on site in these little kitty wading pools and you can see them right here be behind the um, collapsible fish tanks. And this is a picture of Dave Ward actually applying the chemical world known on, in the creek to remove the unwanted non-native fish predators. And the purpose of the renovation was to actually protect the extant fish fauna, which is comprised of the federally endangered Gila chub, and four beyond sensitive fish species, which include the longfin dace, speckle dace, desert sucker, and sonora sucker. Another component of the project and an important component of the project was to also secure habitat for the repatriation of other imperiled Gila River Basin fishes, including the federally endangered Gila top minnow, desert pupfish, loach minnow, and spike dace. Of the four species stock, only Gila top minnow have persisted and are now thriving throughout um, Bonita Creek. As I pointed out earlier, the habitat created by the beaver dam pools is ideal for species like Gila top minnow that, pref that prefer lentic habitat that has very little flow. The preferred habitat of the other species is lacking and is likely the primary reason they did not persist after they were stocked. 
So after the chemical treatment, we followed up with post-treatment post monitoring to determine the efficacy of the chemical treatment. And we did not find any fish, we did not capture any, and we did not see any. So we actually deemed the chemical renovation a success. However, in 2009, during annual monitoring in March, we discovered mosquito fish between road crossings 13 and 14. And if you remember my earlier slide where I have the different road crossings, so the road crossings basically start a little bit um, upstream of the barrier and they start at one and they go all, all the way up to 15. So mosquito fish were found between road crossings 13 and 14. Later that year, we found a bait bucket in May 2009 it was found on the side of the road alongside Bonita Creek. The bucket contained 76 juvenile common carp, one mosquito fish, four juvenile suckers that were unidentified, and a handful of juvenile woodhouse toadlets. In June 2009, we discovered mosquito fish at another location on Bonita Creek between road crossings one and two, and at that, and at that time I also observed what I thought was green sunfish. However, since I did not have the green sunfish in hand, I wasn't willing to say definitively that we now have green sunfish back in Bonita Creek. It wasn't until August that I actually was able to capture the green sunfish. And at that time, we initiated mechanical removal efforts. However, um, before, however, before I move on, I wanted to also, in, mentioned that we also found fathead minnow in the creek in 2010, yellow bullhead in 2011, and bureau crayfish in 2013. So you might be saying to yourself or asking yourself, well, how did these non-natives get back into Bonita Creek? Well, we actually have several plausible explanations. Um, we know definitively that fathead minnow were washed down during flooding events because we do have a population of fatheads that live in the upper portion of the Nita Creek. They're the only non-native fish present and they don't really seem to have that much of a negative impact on the native fish species. And due to the habitat conditions in upper Bonita Creek, there would be no way that we would um, be able to eliminate the fathead minnows. So green sunfish and yellow bullhead and mosquito fish may have actually survived the renovation. Um, as I mentioned, Bonita Creek is dominated by beavers, so there's a lot of beavers in Bonita Creek, and they typically do not make lodges in Bonita Creek, although we do have a couple of those. They typically are um, ginning up back in the stream bank. So their entry into their homes, their dens, is always wetted. So there's quite the likelihood that there are pockets of water that did not receive any chemical during the chemical renovation, so the fish were able to hang out until the water cleared up. Um, the other possibility is that people may have stocked these fish back into the creek. As many of you know, um, in some of these different communities that we reside in, people do not understand conservation um, for threatened and endangered species or even just native species, and so they want things back. They want fish in these habitats that they're more familiar with or comfortable with. Um, and then also, if you recall, I pointed out that we found a bait bucket and the bait bucket did contain a mosquito fish. So the fish could have been um, also bait bucket releases. And right here, I just wanted to point out, this is the bait bucket that we found along the creek. And here are the 76 juvenile carp the four little suckers, and the one mosquito fish. So with the discovery of the green sunfish, as I indicated, we initiated mechanical removal methods. Um, we used a variety of different gear types, including comar nets, G-metal metal traps, hoop nets, custom and crab traps, dip nets, backpack electrofisher, a tote barge shocker, and seines. We basically threw the kitchen sink at this removal effort because we did not know um, what was going to be most effective. 
Um, and so by using a lot of different gear types, we were able to evaluate um, them for their effectiveness to catch fish, the number that could be handled and deployed at any one time, and potential for incidental wildlife or fish mortality. Um, through these evaluations, we worked to optimize removal efforts while minimizing harm to native fish and wildlife. We quickly figured out um, that the Pomar nets and G-metal metal traps were most effective for capturing green sunfish. And what I want to point out on this slide is that we had one of our interns, um, Alex Smallwood, construct a modified perch trap trying to see if we could actually make traps that might be more effective than the traps that were on the market to use. Um, one of the challenges that I'm going to talk about later that I'm going to mention here is that a lot of the habitats that we worked in were really deep and so we could not really get um, effective net sets with some of our nets without risking um, drowning non-targeted wildlife. So we had Alex construct this net that would actually sit pretty flat on the bottom and it had this air pocket that would extend out into the surface more so than some of the nets that you can um, buy online. Um, so we're, we're hoping that if a turtle or a frog got into these traps that they would find this air pocket and they would be okay. However, um, these nets were really unwieldy. You can see that it's a good sized net. They don't collapse. Um, we couldn't really take that many out into the field at any one time. So we quickly um, quit making these traps and pretty much just set them aside because they really weren't that effective. So all our traps that we set um, were baited with Prina dog chow. The Promar collapsible traps were also um, wetted, they were baited with both wet and dry food, whereas the G-metal metal traps were only baited with dry dog chow. Um, all ropes that were attached to the nets were sprayed with an animal repellent and flashing was attached to the rope to deter, deter ugh, excuse me, to deter terrestrial wildlife from messing with the traps. Um, oftentimes you get wildlife that are very curious and not only do they pull the trap out of the water, but they actually want to climb into the trap. We did everything possible to prevent this from happening because again, we didn't want to be affecting other wildlife species that are utilizing um, these areas. So our traps were set primarily in overnight sets with some day sets. We recorded time of deployment and retrieval of nets and our mental traps. However, um, for this presentation, all our effort was summarized as net sets or net nights regardless of the actual time fish. Um, Promar traps were set with an air pocket to prevent non-targeted animals from drowning and fish caught or basically pretty much all the non-native fish caught were measured in millimeters and enumerated. Green sunfish that were 65 millimeters or greater were classified as adult fish. Green sunfish that were less than 65 millimeters were classified as juveniles. All non-native fish captured were euthanized, mainly euthanized, with an overdose of MS-222. In the beginning, when the green sunfish were not widespread throughout Lower Bonita Creek, um, we set hardware cloth across, across the creek closer to road crossing two in hopes that we would prevent the fish from being, being able to move upstream. Um, the hardware cloth was attached with rebar, but as you can see from this picture, um, this fix was very short-lived as debris started piling up against it immediately and the, also the flow started flowing around it, allowing or potentially allowing fish movement. Um, so we quickly figured out that the hardware cloth and rebar were not going to work especially after we discovered green sunfish um, between now moving upstream between road crossings two and three, when previous to this, they were only found between road crossings one and two. So even though the green sunfish had moved further up the stream between road crossings two and three, we were still optimistic that we were, that we'd be able to mechanically remove them. However, 
There's always a however to these stories. On August 14, 2010, um, we detected green sunfish between road crossings 14 and 15. And as if you recall, road crossing 14 and 15 is the upper section of this lower portion of Bonita Creek. So now um, we have green sunfish pretty much spread from above the fish barrier all the way between road crossings in 14 and 15. At this time, I not only wanted to cry and scream, I, I actually walked away in defeat and I told Jeff that there would be no way we, we would now be able to remove them. They were just too widespread. In a way, it was kind of a relief as no one would fault us for giving up since they were now so widespread. However, after a few days of mulling it over, I reached out to Stuart Reed, who was doing non-native fish removal or mechanical non-native fish removal in streams in Oregon where he lived to benefit the Moroc sucker. Stuart actually came down um, and visited me and evaluated the habitat at Bonita Creek and we strategized as we walked the entire lower section of Bonita Creek. Stuart also showed us some of his non-native removal techniques, which we had never employed until Stuart came down, which included night snorkeling and hand netting. So if you have never night snorkeled or hand netted green sunfish, it is an experience that I think everybody should experience at least once in their lifetime. Um, the visit with Stuart and a comment that he made at a Desert Fishes Council meeting regarding finite numbers of non-native fishes resonated with me, and that was what we needed to be motivated to continue again. So basically, um, Stuart came down and he pumped some guts back into us to get us back in the non-native removal of fish business. So um, now that the fish were spread from here, you can see the fish barrier all the way up here to road crossing 15, um, we broke the creek up into these different road crossings to make the removal process more manageable. So a section would be like from the barrier to road crossing one, road crossing one, to road crossing two, and so on as you move up the stream. The reason we did this is that it created really manageable sections that could be worked with a small crew in one or two days. And I think one of the greatest benefits is that it was also psychologically beneficial as it created a sense of accomplishment when a section was cleared of green sunfish. Um, oftentimes we're working with different interns or youth crews and you know when somebody is going out day after day after day and studying that to removing green sunfish and you're not having any response or you're really not able to see um, any type of improvement, you can get burned out, frustrated really easily. But by having these road crossing sections, you would clean an area out and you would really have this great sense of accomplishment and it really helped keep us going. So um, I do wanna mention that an emphasis was placed on trying to remove or clear out the green sunfish in the upper sections first. Um, multiple reasons why. One is that they were last to be invaded, so there were less fish. Um, and also the habitats were a lot easier to work with in this um, upper section. They were sometimes smaller habitats and the substrate was better. Some of our um, harder habitats were down here in the lower reach where there are longer stretches and they were very muddy and the pools were really deep. So it was very challenging to work in some of these lower habitats. So even though we um, put a lot of the effort into working the lower, I'm sorry, the upper sections, we still continued our suppression efforts in these lower reaches during this time. I also wanted to mention that road crossings between eight and nine and nine and 10 were also dry um, off and on during the year. And I think that helped prevent the invasion from this lower section into the upper areas once we got that cleaned up. So actually habitat drying um, reduced the likelihood could of reinvasion of the green sunfish and it helped us out. So um, what did some of our removal efforts look like? These are just a scattering of pictures from over the years showing some of the people removing the green sunfish. Um, 
this picture right here of Lafayette, as you can see, these fish do not look like green sunfish. He participated with the removal um, during the later years where we were starting to see the, the native fish be bound with the removal efforts. So he has basically a net full of Sonora um, suckers, which is really wonderful. And I also want to point out, as I indicated, um, a lot of the habitat at Bonita Creek was heavily vegetated. And you can see all these cattails, down cattails, um, standing cattails, and it created really great habitat for the green sunfish, especially for the smaller sunfish that could hang out and be protected with all this dense cover. Um, so that was another challenge that we faced. We had a lot of aquatic vegetation that we had to deal with. Um, this is a crew from Martian Associates. This is Brian Kesner. He's been um, a very important um, person in the removal efforts. He's been out on pretty much the majority of these removal trips. And Kristen and Brittany, who um, used to work for Martian Associates, have now moved on to other things. And this is my co-author, Jeff Kahn, and a couple interns that we had for a while, Clara and Morgan, and then some other interns and individuals from the Hill Watershed Partnership. So we had a, a lot of different people helping with this removal effort. So it kind of takes some um, a village to raise children, and it kind of takes a village to clean these areas out of green sunfish. So as I mentioned, we had um, many challenges. Um, the actual removal in Bonita Creek proved to be very challenging due to the complex habitat created by beavers from their dam. I love beavers, but the poor habitat that they create can make it very, very hard to remove um, green sunfish from them. So many of the pools that we worked in were extremely deep. I'm about five foot, eight inches tall, and some of the pools were actually over my head. So you can imagine trying to set a net and habitat that deep with an air pocket so you wouldn't hurt other wildlife as you're trying to remove green sunfish. Um, so many of the pools that we worked in, as I said, were extremely deep, and you could not set nets in them unless you lowered the water table or you risk drowning non-targeted wildlife such as snow and mud turtles. So in the beginning, we um, took down the dam by hand using flaskies like Joy is holding here or other handheld equipment like shovels. However, by the next morning, the, the beaver ponds were rebuilt and if you had nets set on them, oftentimes they were already underwater again. So um, starting in 2013, we started to um, construct these um, Clemson beaver pond levelers and install them in the deepest pools that we were working in to lower the water levels. So um, beavers are interesting in that they um, respond to the sight, sound, and feel of running water. These levelers are placed into their dams and pools and they prevent the beavers from sensing that the water is actually leaving their pools, so they do not attempt to plug the levelers. The levelers work extremely well, and to, prove upon, and to improve upon them, we installed these valves that we can turn off or on when we were working in a, in a section of the creek. By turning the valve off when we were not working in the creek, we allowed the water to go back to a level that the beavers felt comfortable in, that they were safe in, that they no longer were um, gonna be targeted by wildlife because their, their, their pools were too low. And if we did not do that without the valve, the beavers would actually go below the pond and construct another dam that would then backfill the pool and then backfill the pool that we were working in. Um, so this prevented the beavers from wanting to go down and create a new pond below the level of. We also actively um, removed the cattails from some of the pools. And as you can see here, we had a pretty large crew removing the cattails. Um, one of the reasons we did that, it, excuse me, one of the reasons that we did this is that we believe that the lack of cover would make the green sunfish seek refuge and be more trappable. So oftentimes when you have all this aquatic vegetation in the water, um, you're going to have the fish hunkered down in it. There's going to be a lot of things for them to eat. 
But when you really open up this habitat, fish, as everybody should know, as everybody likely knows on this webinar, they want to have some type of protection. They want some cover. So we always thought that maybe they'd be more trappable because they would think of the net as being some type of cover. And actually, I think um, some of our effectiveness was from us removing this vegetation. And then again, this is a youth crew from the Forest Service that they loaned us removing cat toads. And you can see that it's, it's a great deal of work to open up some of these habitats to be able to get these green sunfish out. So now we're gonna get into, oh, well, we're not gonna get into our results just yet, more on the beaver dams. So I wanted to mention the other thing about these beaver dams is some of these dams were between four to five feet tall. So I, act, so I actually believe they acted as many barriers to prevent non-native fish from moving upstream, primarily the green sunfish. Um, and what's interesting is that the beavers on the inside of the dam, they would actually pack it with mud and rocks. So there's not like there's a lot of interstitial spaces that a fish could kind of maneuver, maneuver, their, maneuver themselves through to get up into um, habitat further upstream. So again, um, the beaver dams, although they created issues in many aspects of removing green sunfish, I also think they played an important role in helping us keep them um, isolated in certain sections. Okay, from 2009 to 2020, we removed a total of 23,282 green sunfish from Bonita Creek. The majority of green sunfish removed, 21,808 were captured in G-metal mineral traps and chromar nets, which took a total effort of 47,835 net sets. And what I wanted to point out here, and what I kind of alluded to regarding our custom traps, is that we did not use them. Um, we quickly found out that they weren't very effective um, due to their size. And you can actually see that they really didn't catch that many sunfish anyway. The same thing with our crab traps. The other thing that's interesting is electrofishing was not that effective either. And I think um, a lot of individuals that have tried to mechanically remove fish with electrofishing have not been successful. Um, and, I, and, and we can understand why. And that's why um, sometimes you have to look at other methods um, of removing these species that you wanna get out and not just think it's gonna be one size fits all. So by actually utilizing so, there, so many different methods, we kind of were able to figure out what was effective and what wasn't effective. So um, good information was gained from this project. So what I wanted to show you with this graph is the effort in net sets that was expended to remove green sunfish from 2009 to 2018. The x-axis shows the removal years from 2009 to 2018, whereas the primary y-axis is showing the number of green sunfish removed, and the secondary y-axis is showing the effort expended. And I wanna show you right here, so the light blue right here denotes the G metal mineral traps, the green is the promar, the yellow is the hoop, hoop nets, and then the darker blue is when we did not differentiate the catch between promars and G metal mineral traps, they were combined. And then the lines right here show the effort for the different traps that were set. And what I wanted to emphasize or point out on this graph is that you can see that in 2009, very little effort was expended. And that's because our removal did not actually start until August of that year. And just so everybody's clear, this 162 and 47, that represents how many nets were set that year to remove the green sunfish. Um, and what you can see this graph, graph should tell you is that our effort varied um, over the years and was largely 
due to not having um, enough funding or manpower to consistently keep setting these nets to remove the green sunfish. However, in 2016, we received additional funding from the Washington Office of the Bureau of Land Management, and we also received some additional funding from the Bureau of Reclamation. With this money, we were able to hire a dedicated crew and were able to more than double our effort from 2015 to 2016, um, which by allowing us to double the effort, we were able to reduce the green sunfish numbers to the point where they no longer were able to successfully reproduce and recruit. You can see that in 2015, we roughly had like 6,000 um, net nights, whereas in 2016, we had over 14,000 net nights. And by just having that additional effort, you can see how we were able to crash the population of green sunfish. So um, this slide shows the number of green sunfish we removed each year in the upper, middle, and lower reaches. And what I want to point out is from 2011 to 2013, we, we expended a lot of our effort in these upper two reaches, the upper, the upper reach and the middle reach. And again, the reason we did that is they were the last habitats to be um, invaded and if you get the upper sections cleared out, you no longer have fish if they're reproducing moving downstream. Um, and again, these areas I, I mentioned earlier, they were a lot easier to work in. So even though, again, we focused the effort in the upper two reaches, we still maintained, as you can see, some level of effort throughout the lower reach. Um, what I, the take home message here is by the end of 2013, the majority of green sunfish were basically eliminated from the upper and middle reach. And during 2014 to 2016, we were able to eliminate the last few remaining green sunfish in these upper two reaches. By doing that, we were then able to increase the effort in the lower, lower reach by four times the previous effort. Um, and we were able to finally eliminate the green sunfish from the lower reach by 2007. So this graph basically shows what we were able to do with the extra funding that we got from the Washington Office of BLM and the Bureau of Reclamation. By hiring a dedicated crew, we worked from January 25th, 2016 to October 27th, 2017, just between road crossing two and three, which was, as I indicated earlier, one of the larger habitats that we had in Bonita Creek where we had green sunfish. So we were able to average around 150 net per set or per night for four days per week with breaks around the monsoon period, um, July through September. And the key point of this slide is I want everybody to look at um, October 12, 2016, we removed one green sunfish. We then had 14 additional removal trips where we captured no green sunfish. Then on um, March 2nd, 2017, we captured again, just one more green sunfish. Then we had seven additional removal trips where we captured none. And then on our eighth removal trip, we captured two green sunfish. So oftentimes in these removal projects, you end up where you capture one or two fish and then you monitor for maybe three, four, five additional trips and you don't capture any more of whatever your target species is. And you think, okay, well, the habitat is clear, we're good, we can walk away. However, if we would have walked away after three, four, five, six, seven trips, we still would have had three, uh, excuse me, three green sunfish in this lower section between road crossings two and three. And we may have, you know, if we would have walked away, these three fish, if the sexes were right, would have reproduced and we pretty much could have been back to you know, ground zero. So it's very important that you continue with your monitoring because again, 
um, if we would have stopped earlier, we would have missed fish. And the same thing here with this one. Um, if these two, these two fish were found in the same net. So not sure, unfortunately, um, I wish we would have checked them, but even if we would have stopped here, we would have still had two fish and we could have been back to um, the place where we started at. So again, you have to keep continuing to follow monitoring. And today we're still monitoring to make sure that we do not see any green sunfish and so far we have not. So I'm now gonna move on to our mechanical removal effort, case study two for mechanical removal of green sunfish um, from Horse Camp Canyon. So Horse Camp Canyon is located well, let me first say, Horse Camp Canyon is a tributary to Aravaipa Creek and is located within the Aravaipa Canyon Wilderness. Um, for those of you that are not aware, Aravaipa Creek is referred to as the crown jewel of native fish streams in Arizona due to its irreplaceable value to native fish. Um, Aravaipa Creek flows for approximately 22 miles from private lands on PNC all the way downstream here to just above the upper fish barrier. So this is considered the east end of Aravaipa, and this area over here is considered the west end. So from the east end, to get to Horse Camp Canyon, where we had the green sunfish problem, it's approximately five and a half miles um, one way. So round trip, it's about 11 miles. So this is a picture of the entrance to Horse Camp Canyon. It's a beautiful canyon with fantastic views. And if you've never been to Aravaipa Creek, I strongly suggest you visit someday because it's very um, much worth it. So Aravaipa Creek supports two federally endangered fish species, including loach minnow, spike dace, and also five beyond sensitive fish species, including the round toe chub, Speckled days, long-thin days, desert sucker, and Nora sucker. It also supports three non-native fish species, including the star of um, this presentation, green sunfish, yellow bullhead, and also red shiner. What's interesting is that both green sunfish and yellow bullhead were first detected in um, Aravaipa Creek in 1963, whereas red shiner were first detected in 1990. All three species um, have different ranges throughout um, Aravaipa Creek, with yellow bullhead being found pretty much throughout the entire system, whereas uh, the red shiner and green sunfish have more limited distributions throughout Aravaipa Air Creek based on our monitoring data. So we actually removed green sunfish from 0.5 mile reach in Horse Camp Canyon that is characterized by boulder and bedrock pools and slots. Horse Camp Canyon, as far as we knew at the time and what we know now is the only source, known source of green sunfish into Aravaipa Creek during the monsoon period when a surface connection exists between the two systems. Um, we believe that if we were able to eliminate green sunfish from Horse Camp Canyon, that we would then be able to eliminate them from the main stem of Aravaipa Creek because there's limited pools and backwater habitats. And also the natural flow flood regime in Aravaipa would make conditions less than ideal for green sunfish. So you can just see, this slide just depicts the different types of habitats that, were, that are present in Horse Camp Canyon. Um, one of the challenging areas to work was the slot canyon, or this, yeah, this little slot. And you see this individual here, she's actually swimming. So again, you have the challenge of trying to set your nets to capture fish without harming other wildlife. So the methods that we use to remove green sunfish from Horse Camp Canyon were very similar to what we used at um, Bonita Creek. Our G-metal minnow traps, collapsible comar nets, seines, and backpack electrofishers were all gear types that we used in Bonita Creek. 
In addition, we added an aquarium dip net, and I'm sure some of you are wondering, you added an aquarium dip net. Yes, those little aquarium dip nets that you use for your home aquarium. We also eliminated the tote bar chopper, the hoop nets, and custom and crab caps due to the habitats being much smaller. And again, we found out that some of these traps were just not that, that effective. So um, the one thing that we did that was a little different that we did not do at Bonita Creek is that we seamed and dip netted the habitat in Horse Camp Canyon prior to nets being set because we were very effective with seining and dip netting. Again, um, the methodology was pretty much the same. We set all our traps with air pockets because we did not want to um, drown captured amphibians and reptiles. Um, Air Vipa Creek supports a robust, healthy population of lowland leopard frogs and also Sonora mud turtles. Um, and we didn't want to be drowning any of those organisms. Same thing, um, time of deployment, we recorded. However, everything is going to be summarized as net nights, adult fish, um, 65 millimeters or greater, juveniles, 65 millimeters um, or less, or less than 65 millimeters. And again, all our non-native fish were humanely euthanized with an overdose of MS triple two. I do want to note that fish collected by crews in 2011 and 2012 were not measured or categorized by net type caught in. So everything was just lumped together, no matter if they were caught in a G-metal mineral trap or a Pilmar net or same. So from 2010 to 2015, we removed a total of 3,910 green sunfish and one yellow bullhead using a variety of different gear types as you can see. The majority of fish, 2,675 were captured in traps and nets. 1,125 were removed by seining, and 105, believe it or not, were captured with an aquarium dip net and five by backpack collective fishing. At the end of 2013, we were no longer capturing green sunfish. Um, Follow-up monitoring in spring and early summer of 2014 resulted in the capture and removal of four green sunfish and three in the fall of 2015. These few fish were scattered among the different separated pools that I showed you in a previous slide, and their numbers were low enough that they were not able to successfully reproduce during those years. If all removal methods are combined, um, juvenile green sunfish comprise 43% of the total patch. Adults comprise 40% and 17% were unknown age classes because as I mentioned, we had a period where the fish were not measured. So in 2016 and 17, we did visual surveys of the pools and we observed a lot of native fish, frogs, and an abundance of aquatic invertebrates but no green sunfish. Um, I want to point out here, these are some frog eggs. I believe this is a canyon tree frog tadpole, and this is a lowland leopard frog. As I mentioned, we have a lot of lowland leopard frogs in Aravipa, and they're doing very well. Um, I wanted to mention that one of the things that we noted in 16 and 17 is that we had an abundance of aquatic insects and tadpoles, which is a good indicator, a strong indicator, that you do not have predatory fish present. However, since visual surveys, like all surveys, are imperfect, we followed up and in September 2018, we set 40 G metal metal traps and 10 Pomar nets um, and did not capture any green sunfish. However, we did capture native fish, frogs, and a turtle. Um, the numbers for native fish were low compared to what we observed in 2016 and 2017 and was likely due to a flood event on September 2nd that likely washed the majority of fish out back into Aravipa Creek. Um, so here is one of our Sonora suckers. This is a long thin base, another lowland leopard frog, a tadpole, and a little itsy bitsy Sonora mud turtle. So again, I, I, I keep reemphasizing the need to set air pockets um, with these nets that we deploy. We didn't want to kill 
all this non targeted these non targeted species, which typically and quite frequently would get into our traps because of the bait that we use. They wanted something to eat. So, and I am going to go ahead and say we did not have mortalities with these organisms because, again, we did keep these air pockets, which were critical. So, um, this slide is similar to the slide that I had for um, the Native Creek, and it basically shows the number of green sunfish removed by year um, using G and Tomar traps combined, the amount of effort in net night and cash per unit effort from 2010 through 2015 and 2018. When we first started removal, we had no idea the level of um, effort that would be required to eliminate the green sunfish. At the end of the end of every year, up until 2013, we would drop the number of green sunfish captured to double digits. We would then come back the following year and we would restart the whole process over again as the green sunfish would have reproduced. Um, and, we, and we kept saying to ourselves, this is actually stupid, you know, because you're having to walk in round trip 11 miles carrying gear, and it was hard, it's hard work to do this. Um, so finally, to stop the cycle, we had more than double our effort in 2013 from what we had in 2012. And by doing this, we were again able to overexploit the population and decrease our capturing effort. By doing this, we were able to crash the population, similar to what we did at Bonita Creek. As we only captured four green or four green sunfish in 2014, three in 2015, and zero in 2018. So the main reason why we continue the removal cycle year after year is that we did not have enough people. We did not have enough people to help carry gear in the Horse Camp Canyon. Um, again, by receiving extra money in 2013, we were able to hire an American Conservation Experience youth group, which is shown right here, and they were able to help us hike in and out the equipment and supplies that we needed. By having enough field and camping gear, we were able to continue setting nets until we were no longer capturing green sunfish, and that took place in 2013. Follow-up monitoring in 2014 and 2015 removed the last remaining green sunfish from Horse Camp Canyon. But what this picture represents is just the amount of people needed to allow us to get into this canyon to eliminate these fish. These individuals are each carrying um, 10 metal nets. This individual has a backpack shocker and, excuse me, so you can just see when you're carrying in this much type of gear, you can't, um, you can't do it with only one or two people. You basically need a whole crew. So that's one of the key lessons here too, is that if you're able to hire individuals to help you out with these removal efforts, it will pay dividends. So I'm um, gonna move on to lessons learned. The results for Bonita Creek and Aravipa Creek suggested in systems that are isolated either naturally or with a barrier, non-native removal, um, non-native mechanical removal can be effective in either eliminating or reducing the densities of non-native fish species. The importance of timing the removal effort to reduce the number of spawning adults is equally as important as the amount of effort expended. Underestimating the effort needed, funding constraints, and lack of personnel are the primary reasons it took nine years to eliminate green sunfish from Bonita Creek and five years from Horse Camp Canyon. If we would have had the funding and the manpower um, in the very beginning, um, I'm pretty confident we would have been able to eliminate the fish in both of these systems within one or two years. So after years of effort, we can now say that green sunfish are eliminated from the lower reach of Bonita Creek and Horse Camp Canyon. What's really great is that it appears by eliminating the green sunfish from Horse Camp Canyon, we were also able to eliminate the source into Aravipa Creek. We no longer capture green sunfish in the main stem of Aravipa Creek during our biannual fish monitoring, which takes place in the spring and fall, and no green sunfish have been detected during surveys to remove non-native, um, and, and we're not detecting any green sunfish during our surveys to remove non-native yellow bullhead. Um, if you think about it, this is actually quite remarkable 
as green sunfish were first detected in Aravaipa Creek in 1963 and resided in Aravaipa Creek for 52 years. So I would like to end with acknowledgement, acknowledgements to our funding partners and collaborators. I have to give a huge, huge, huge shout out to David Hugh and Karen Prentice who are with the Bureau of Land Management in the Washington office. Without their funding in 2016, we would never have been able to eliminate the green sunfish from Bonita Creek. I also want to recognize Elroy Masters, who's our state lead for fish and wildlife in Arizona. He was also instrumental in helping us get funding for these projects from the Washington office. I want to shout out to the Bureau of Reclamation, Rob Parkson, who at the very beginning helped to provide funding to start the removal effort in Bonita Creek. Also, I want to thank Bill Stewart and Kent Moser, who have continued to fund non-native removal in Arabica and also Bonita Creek. So thank you very much. A big shout out to Martian Associates, Paul Marsh and Brian Tesner. Um, Brian has been um, a, a great asset. He's out in the field for many of the removal and he has provided a lot of great ideas and great suggestions. And Paul Marsh has always been and always will be a staunch supporter of any conservation efforts that um, efforts that benefit native fishes. So thank you very much. Thanks to Mary Richardson for, from the Fish and Wildlife Service. She's always been very supportive of the removal project. Same thing, thank you Tony Robinson, Arizona Game and Fish Department. He's also been a, a great advocate and a strong advocate for the conservation of desert fishes. And also I wanna thank all our interns and other individuals that have helped from Chicago Botanic Garden interns, the Tula Watershed Partnership. Shout out to Peter Ryanthal and his many students that have provided assistance at Bonita Creek. Also independent, Chuck Minkley, Eric Wallace, Jess Gwynn, Hannah Moore, Terry Johnson, Bryce Richardson, and Megan Richardson with your Mary Richardson's children. They've actually got in to the removal process. Richard England and of course Stuart Reed. Um, I also wanted to mention that work was authorized by permits issued by Arizona Game and Fish Department and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And thank you, and I'm gonna turn it back to Alex and Matt. And everybody, thank you for your time today. Great, thank you so much, Heidi. That was a really interesting and excellent presentation. Um, so I just wanted to mention we're pretty close to 11 o'clock, but um, we're going to keep the webinar open for at least another five or 10 minutes. So if folks have questions, please feel free to stay on and enter those in the chat box. Um, so Heidi, we did have a few questions come in during your presentation, and I'll just start reading some of those out. Um, I'd also like to mention if folks are uh, going to leave the webinar, Matt will put a link to the corresponding case study that's published on CCAS. So if you're interested in more information, we have a case study um, published online now that um, discusses this work from Heidi. So uh, first question, this was a little earlier on. So going back to some of your methods, um, we mentioned this in the case study, but for folks who joined today on the webinar, uh, Ethan was wondering if you use bait in any of the traps, and if so, what type of bait did you use? Yeah, we used Purina wet and dry dog food. So the Promar traps receive both wet food and dry food because they come with a bait bag that contains the wet food, whereas the G-Metal Mineral traps, we only put in dry food because the wet bait would just fall through um, the mesh. So we definitely use bait. Okay, yeah, we, we mentioned that in the case study and that's great information for uh, other folks who are interested. Those are sometimes details that are uh, really important, but you know, sometimes left out. So um, you can read more about that in the case study too. So uh, Nina wrote, um, did you find that some of your less effective methods were particularly effective in a subset of the habitats you sampled? Um, the slide with the comparisons of methods might lead you to not use less effective methods. Well, um, because we were seeing most benefit or the majority of fish that we were removing 
were found in like the promar traps and the G metal mineral traps or nets. Um, we pretty much started just focusing on using those nets. The hoop nets were also very effective in some of the deeper water habitat in Bonita Creek. Um, other than like with saning and things like that, it's just not effective in that deeper water habitat. And for electric fishing, um, some of the water, some of the habitat was just so large, we just were not effective in capturing those fish. And it's almost was easier to set the traps because you could set, you know, dozens if not hundreds of nets. Um, and it was just, you'd, you'd get more fish than you would get for electric fishing. So we also had to kind of divide our time up and use it as wisely as possible. And the nets just seemed to be most effective. Okay, and then another follow-up question from Stuart. Uh, wondering whether you ever tried, uh, with, tried nets without using bait. I'm assuming tried nets without bait. No, but I was gonna mention that I know there are individuals um, that trap without using bait. Um, again, because we're trying to be as effective as possible, we figured that if you have bait, you're gonna increase, you know, I don't have any data, you know, backing this up, but we did feel that with bait, we are increasing the odds of getting fish because that bait's gonna be leaving a scent in the water. And if a fish is hungry, they're gonna get into that trap. So anything to be more effective. I know there probably have been times that maybe a net hasn't received bait, but I can't, you know, say that we recorded any information like that, that it was as effective as, you know, a baited trap. But that would be an interesting study. And also trying out the different types of baits to see what is most effective would be worthwhile looking into. Okay, so another question. Uh, what were the age classes of the four later green sunfish captures in Bonita Creek, especially the last two captures? They were juveniles. All right, so um, we'll hang out for a few more minutes to see if we have any more questions. Okay, so two more that, one more question that came in. Hold on just a second, Heidi. Couple oh, questions fine. again. Okay, so um, this is from uh, Tony in Washington, D.C. So during my years working in Ariabipa Creek, uh, Minkley suspected that the sunfish in Horse Camp Creek were coming from stock tanks on or around the canyon rim. Has that potential threat been verified or disputed? I wonder if that's Tony Velasco. Yes. It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tony. Um, glad you caught the presentation. Um, yes, um, we have surveyed the stock tanks in the watershed, and none of them contained any non-native fish species. Now, as everybody knows, that one week or one year, you can have a stock tank that's free of fish, and then you have a permittee or a private landowner stock it, and then, you know, the next day you have non-native fish in the watershed. But yes, we did confirm that there was no sources from the, the watershed into Horse Camp Canyon. And what's interesting too, is that there are some upper pools in Horse Camp Canyon that are much deeper than the habitat that we worked in. But the upper section of Horse Camp Canyon where they had different types of pools, they never had green sunfish. So that further supported um, our belief that you know, our surveys were effective in the upper watershed because if fish were coming in from upstream, they would have been in some of those pools that were higher up in Horse Camp Canyon, which they never were. But that's a good question because if you don't eliminate the fish from the watershed, the non-natives, you're just gonna continue to be battling. That was a good question. Um, so I think 
well, we have time for one more question. So I'll give folks a few more seconds. If you have a question, feel free to enter it in the chat box. And if anyone on here has questions about CCAST, feel free to email any of the contacts listed on this slide. And I was going to say, if anybody out there is interested in getting and seeing Bonita Creek or Aravipa Creek, contact me and I can get you out there. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. It looks like an incredible place to work. So uh, yeah, I hope folks are you know, interested in following up. Thank you. So yeah, on that note, um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this webinar was recorded and we will make it available on our CCAST YouTube channel in the next few days. You can access the YouTube channel on the Desert Landscape Conservation Center website or, by, or find it by searching for Desert LCC on YouTube. If you missed last month's webinar on humpback chub translocations and non-native trout removal in Grand Canyon National Park, we did just upload the recording from that on our YouTube channel, so you can find that on YouTube as well. And I'd also like to invite everyone to visit us on CCAST, where we have a case study on the work presented by Heidi today that is available now. Um, Matt already put that URL in the chat box, so feel free to click that and you can read more about this project. And we also hope that you'll be able to join us in June as we continue the non-native aquatics webinar series. Um, in June, we're gonna feature some work by uh, various folks from the University of Arizona, Arizona Game and Fish, and Fish and Wildlife Service on bullfrog control efforts in Southern Arizona. Also, if you're interested in joining a community of practice on non-native aquatic species, uh, please send me or Matt an email or you can message us in the chat box. We are holding our first non-native aquatics monthly call this upcoming Thursday. Um, so again, we wanna thank you everyone today for joining and especially thank you Heidi for your excellent presentation and we hope you have an excellent day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody.